Okay, is my mic on? Yes? Okay. Um, all right, well, I'm Pamela Vickers. I am really enjoying Madison Ruby so far. I hope all of you are. Sounds like everyone is, so I'm not going to worry too much. Um, do you all remember this article? It's, I think from 2012. Yeah. yeah. So it was something people were sharing either like out of hate or out of like, yeah, this guy's really telling it the way it is. Um, it's essentially the coding horror guy saying that all of these big efforts to get people to learn how to code are fundamentally flawed. And his main reasons were it assumes that more code in the world is an inherently desirable thing. It assumes that coding is the goal. It puts the method before the problem. And it assumes that adding naive, novice, not even sure they like this whole programming thing, coders to the workforce, is a net positive for the world. And finally, it implies that there is a thin, easily permeable membrane between learning to program and getting paid to program professionally. So maybe some of his points had some, some merit. But his post, if you go back and read it, it largely reads as if people are like getting forced into learning how to code. Like there's government checkpoints making sure that you've done your yearly hour of code. But what really stood out to me when I saw it was that these final two points had nothing to do with why people shouldn't learn how to code. They had everything to do with how the developer community uh, greets and absorbs new learners and new coders. So the people who disagreed with him tended to have a uh, fuller context and, and contact with these new learners. Um, Zed Shaw was so enraged that he wrote this rebuttal blog post saying, please don't become anything, especially not a programmer. Um, and the people who agreed, I think I found just more in the comments section, uh, they had like this vague understanding, like they're these new coders, but it, they didn't seem to have known or met any. So I mean, these new coders, they're not just drones that are just showing up and like typing things into existence. They're individuals, they're people. They have values, they have ideas, they have life experiences. So I don't know why we wouldn't just be excited to, to see them. Um, we can only benefit by welcoming them. So I'm not really saying that everyone should learn to code, but that anyone should be able to. So this talk, <laughs> this talk is about how we greet new learners as they're approaching that first major obstacle on their learning path um, because what their first encounter is can really shape who they will become as a developer. So this is, this is roughly what it can look like. So meet Tenderfoot, who's never been so giant in her entire little unicorn <laughs> life. Um, so we're going to follow her, her path. So her ultimate goal is to scale that mountain, but she's starting all the way over here, over my head. And each level as she travels is going to represent a stage in her learning. Um, I'm basing these stages on research done by a 1970s psychologist um, called Noel Birch. And the stages are starting with unconscious incompetence, where you don't know what you don't know. In Tenderfoot's world, we're going to call it the dark and foggy forest. Then you move into conscious incompetence, where you know what you don't know or the valley before the climb. <laughs> then you move into know what you know, or the steeply sloping ascent. And then you kind of finally land in this unconscious competence stage, where you don't know what you know. And we're going to call that the hazy and lofty clouds. So this forest, that's, that's where she's starting. Um, that's the dark and foggy forest, because she can't even see the mountain from here. She knows in theory that there is a mountain, but she's got to get out of the forest to even get to the canyon. This is the place where a lot of beginners first search for something like, how do I learn to code? Um, so this is where we meet a new character, Bingle. So <laughs> Bingle's there to answer questions. Bingle has no awareness of what the end goal is, so sometimes the answers are more or less helpful. And earlier in the journey, less helpful and maybe more burdensome. Much like Scarecrow from Wizard of Oz, when Tenderfoot asked Bingle, how do I learn to code? She's told many different conflicting things. So, Pardon me, that way is a very nice way. Who said that? <laughs> Don't be silly. 
really, Toto. Scarecrows don't talk. It's pleasant down that way, too. <laughs> That's funny. Wasn't he pointing the other way? Of course, people do go both ways. So, <laughs> unfortunately, Tenderfoot at this point kind of just has to pick her direction all on her own. Uh, this sounds very similar to something an Atlanta Rails Girl member, Raven Covington, told me. She said, as I began learning, I found there's so much great content on the internet that's both awesome and overwhelming. It is difficult for me to chart my own path and figure out where to go next. So Tenderfoot, like Raven and Dorothy, must just pick a direction, arbitrarily really pursue it. So she does just that. Step by uninformed step, she begins making her way to the edge of the forest. But let's talk about the mountain now. So this mountain on the other side of the canyon, it slopes upward into the clouds, and there are other people in different stages on it. They're climbing, they're uh, hiking, they're mountain goats, they're goatlers, they're whatever. Um, <laughs> at the tip top of the mountain, that's where those on level four reside. They are the unconscious competence crowd. They don't remember climbing the mountain, and they don't even remember that they're on a mountain anymore. All they know is their life in the cloud. They're pretty happy that way. But sometimes, one can wake up and stroll down to visit the other folks. But these are the special people. These are the people who can remember how they got up there so they can retrace it back down. They are, by some learning models, in the fifth stage of learning called reflective competence or conscious competence of unconscious competence. <laughs> so it's likely that you've worked with someone in this level four community. They're experts at their craft. They've been doing it for a long time. Um, they're great to talk to if you need some guidance with maybe a new tool or uh, a difficult architecture question. But if you get to something a little bit more fundamental, they, they kind of flounder when trying to describe it to you. They've known their craft for so long that they don't remember learning it. But sometimes you get the privilege of working with someone in this level five group, someone who remembers. They're the best teachers, the best mentors. They can break ideas down into new ways and can wait and let you catch up when you're not quite following them. Others in the mountain community, they kind of cycle between level two, unconscious, uh, conscious incompetence, and level three, the conscious competence. So they kind of enjoy climbing, rappelling back down. Uh, they're learning, they're relearning. They're, they're on a consistent slope upwards in their learning. And these are the people that often kind of go to the canyon to visit to see if there's anyone on the other side that they can spot. So if we were to pin your location somewhere on the mountain, uh, where do you think you would be? Uh, junior, mid-level, I'm guessing you're probably somewhere down here where you, you know what you don't know. And maybe you're approaching where you know what you know. Um, maybe, maybe you're self-aware enough to, to know that you live up here, that you're living in the clouds. But ideally, we'd all strive to be in this level five group where we remember and we can hang out at the top, but we also make visits down to help bring people back up. So back to Tenderfoot, she's, she's still in this dark forest. It's not scary, but it's vast. She's trying to just find her own way. She's asking Bingle for help with directions, but we saw Bingle's not the most helpful right now. She's, she's learning every little thing that she finds and putting it in her knapsack. She's getting what is it, you know, Python, Ruby on Rails, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all of the things, just shoving it in there. There, It's heavy, it's getting mixed up. She'll try to bring one out, she'll grab the wrong one, but she doesn't really know. It's just a mixed garbled mess because she doesn't even know why any of the pieces are in her knapsack to begin with. So her route, imperfect, imprecise, but she eventually finds her way to the edge of the trees. She steps out into the light. She hikes up to the canyon ledge and sees a couple of mountaineers on the other side. She feels relieved, she feels excited. This must be where things get easier. So she tries to get their attention, no one really sees her. So 
She writes a note on a paper airplane and flies it across. She asks, hey, new friends, how do I get across this canyon? Then she waits. So you've probably seen this type of thing before. There's the uninformed question on Stack Overflow, or the person just full of questions on like IRC or a community Slack, maybe even in person at a meetup. Um, and they're just earnestly asking for initial direction and help, but they're asking something huge and vague. But just, just pause and think. These questions they're asking and the responses they receive might be the first contact they have with the developer community. I think that's really scary. Um, so I've taken a look at the learning programming Reddit group, and it's actually pretty supportive but you'll often see this sort of thing, where someone's trying to help, but they attach a lot of discouraging messaging. So let's say, Red, uh, let's say that Tinderfoot wrote this post. Um, I want to really dig into programming, but I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. I'm up, uh, so this person said, I read posts here, and I'm absolutely lost in the amount of technical jargon and such. More than jargon, I'm worried about the mathematical aspects of programming. I've struggled for most of my educational career with anything beyond advanced algebra. Can anyone give me some insight into what level of math I should be proficient in if I want to go anywhere with programming? So the top voted reply was long and uh, obviously very well thought out, but it began with this series of questions. The first thing you want to do is take a look at yourself. Do you like math? Do you like logic problems? Are you good at breaking complex problems into parts? If you answered yes to one or more of these, keep reading. If that stuff sounds like a drag, please save yourself some time, look into something else. That is all that programming is, and if you delve deeper, you will find just that. So this post ended with some great advice, but if you're already feeling overwhelmed and flailing, you probably won't even get to that part of the post. So on the other hand, Sarah May wrote a blog post about when she was first developing the RailsBridge curriculum and how surprised she was to discover that programming is not math. She wrote, uh, I'm sorry, she wrote, people with a math background did fine, of course, but people with a heavy language background often did better. And she saw this again when she worked with high school students. She noticed that monolingual kids didn't do as well as children who spoke two or more languages. So she said she thought back to all of her programming experience, her friend's programming experience, and she realized it's absolutely not math. So it's a pretty big difference from this fellow who posted this and what Sarah May said. So let's just consider treating every paper airplane we come across as you know, a, a delicate paper crane, because we don't know what someone's state is in when they've written a post. And we want to be encouraging while crafting helpful answers because our answer could be the first and the last that the tenderfoot receives. So our tenderfoot is waiting on her answer. She's reading and typing away, learning all of the things without learning anything, really. Uh, she gets a reply. It says, haven't you heard of a bridge? Wah, wah. <laughs> so that's, she gets a reality check. She's worried that the people on the other side aren't really that helpful aren't really that happy to help her. So another Tenderfoot Redditor wrote a post that asked, why are experienced programmers so hostile toward beginners? They said, it's usually assumed I haven't done my own research, which is never the case, and for every helpful reply, it seems that I'll get four or five useless replies attempting to call me out for my own laziness. That would really hurt. So fortunately, our reply is more smug and not that aggressive. But even better, we get a second reply. This one says, are you asking how to build a bridge? So that one feels a little bit better, but what? it's still not that helpful. So what on Tenderfoot's side could be done better to get more helpful answers? Um, Stack Overflow wrote a guide to asking the perfect question. Um, and it's essentially start out with the golden rule. Imagine you're trying to answer it. Uh, provide context about the technologies you're using. Frame the problem. Uh, describe the larger goal and the smaller goal so you can avoid the XY problem um, where you ask about the solution instead of the actual problem at hand. Uh, provide sample code and data, but not everything. 
And finally, write something articulately so you've communicated clearly what you're actually trying to do. What Stack Overflow doesn't say is that you should keep the same things in mind when answering. So be kind, be clear, and share your thoughts and assumptions so that when they read your solution, they understand how you got to it and why you're proposing it. So Tenderfoot takes a moment before writing her next note. This time she says, hello, I've just found this canyon. I'd like to cross it. I don't know how wide or how deep it is, but I see that some of you have made it across. Can you tell me what you did in order to get there? I'd like to build a bridge, but I'm not sure what materials to use. So this time, the reply she gets back is a little bit longer. It says, hi, Tenderfoot. Crossing the canyon is super easy. All you need to do is grab your foo and then bar the baz. Make sure you don't baz the bar or else the food will bezizzle. <laughs> See you soon. No idea. <laughs> so have you ever heard the phrase drinking from the fire hose? Um, much like our Tinderfoot Redditor from before, it's easy as a new learner to get completely lost in the vocabulary on top of all the other things they're trying to learn. So, I mean, if you haven't seen this, you probably haven't gone to a Ruby conference, but this image is so massive, it's, you have to break it up into parts to really see it. But it's what people are learning when they're learning Ruby on Rails. It's uh, web stuff, it's OS stuff, it's database, deployment, command line, text editor stuff, argue about all those things all the time. Uh, we have Ruby language, Ruby management, Rails. I mean, you know, that is really, that's just easy, right? So when we call these things easy, or say you just do the thing, that, that's not true. When you're drinking from the fire hose, literally nothing is easy. So we need to drop these phrases from our vocabulary. They're lazy, they're filler, they're not making other people feel good about what they're trying to learn. But does that also mean that when you're helping someone, you should change your word choices? Like, isn't a string always a string? Sarah Simon, she is a graduate of the Turing School, and she was a former English major, and she wrote some of her takeaways at the end of her time there. Um, and unsurprisingly, one of the things she wrote about is fluency. She says, trying to understand something without having the vocabulary to speak coherently about it is a lost cause. Pay your dues, learn the system before anything else. By building fluency, you allow connections to fall naturally into place. With fluency, you'll be able to do incredible things. <laughs> So there's responsibility on both sides of the canyon. When mentors provide definitions and uh, don't use the shorthand description of things, they can provide illumination and it removes the presumption that the person's following what you're saying. And when mentees kind of catalog and, and learn new vocabularies, they encounter it, it allows them to receive more precise help and helps them get to a solution more quickly. So Tenderfoot spends some time parsing her latest note. Uh, she asks Bingo for help translating some of it, and some of it starts to make more sense to her, but she's still stuck on a few things. She reads, all you need to do is grab your foo and then bar the baz. She looks in her knapsack, but she does not have a foo available to bar the baz. Getting tools and environments set up, even as an experienced developer, feels at best tedious and at worst impossible. Installing tools to install other tools and dependencies, it starts to feel like installationception. That's horrifying, it's too big. Um, so, so when things go wrong, it can be confusing. When things go right, I, yeah, when things go right, it can be confusing. When things go wrong, it's confusing and discouraging. So if you're helping someone get their environment set up and you encounter these inevitable problems, uh, try not to let your frustration take over, even though it is frustrating. Because when you're visibly frustrated, they can feel responsible and you can ostracize them and, and they're in a more vulnerable position. Um, so I'm guilty of some of these myself, so I know that these sort of exchanges happen. But so you might encounter a difficult question, like how do I get RVM installed on my 1995 ThinkPad? Uh, here's a horrible answer, get a new MacBook Pro. <laughs> Another difficult question, I'm having issues installing something on my Windows, Linux, whatever machine. Any ideas why? 
Another horrible answer. Yeah, because everything's harder on Windows, Linux, whatever. So when we say these kind of things, even tongue in cheek, what the person can be hearing is, this is hard, I'm not enjoying doing this, and you're not gonna be able to really become a developer because of the machine you have right now. So don't do this. Instead, use these difficult installations as an opportunity to show how you troubleshoot and how you read the error message every time and how sometimes you have to ask for help because some of these things are just weird and they're difficult. So back to Tenderfoot. She still doesn't have a foo. She looks for one, no luck. She asks Bingle, where do I get a foo? Bingle offers, do you mean where I get some food? Not helpful, Bingle. <laughs> Given her experience with notes from before, she spends a long time trying to figure this out all on her own. Finally, when she's completely defeated, she sends another message. She says, sorry, what is a foo? Can't seem to find one. Sorry to ask so many questions. She quickly gets a reply that says, oh goodness, did I say a foo? I meant to say a norf. Have a great day. So here we have Tinderfoot having lost countless precious day. Her, her light, her hours in the daylight are just totally done and she needed a norf all along. So when we have tutorials with out of date information or we give someone kind of a half answer, um, we can send them in the wrong direction for way too long. So think about the helpful information you put out into the world as akin to, say, the code that you write for the developer who's going to find it later. There's a common courtesy involved. So checking in when possible to see if something that you've suggested has helped can save so much time for someone who's new to this. Just a quick, did that work for you? Might save them days. So Tenderfoot now, armed with this new, updated, correct information, uses Bingle and finds a NORF. She's very happy about that. She reviews and revises her instructions. Grab your NORF and borrow the Baz. With some help from Bingle and a few informative searches later, what is a bar, what is a Baz, how do I bar? She carefully, meticulously bars the Baz. She looks up and sees a single step has appeared on her side of the bridge. She's very happy about that. She waits, and nothing else happens. She's one step closer, but only one of many. So she timidly, timidly writes another note and flies it to her friends. She says, hello, friends. I've successfully barred the baths. I have a step in my bridge now. Thank you so much. What do I do to finish my bridge? The reply arrives, and they say, great news. Now just keep at it. You have to bar a lot of bazes to finish building your bridge across the canyon. See you soon. So she bars the baths again. Another step appears. Bars the baths again. Another step appears. So what is, this, what is she doing? Um, back in Reddit land, a Tenderfoot Redditor asks, is it OK if I'm successfully going through Code Academy lessons while not fully understanding some of them? They describe their situation. I'm about halfway through the Python course. It's not quite clicking yet. I haven't been having any problems with any of the lessons, but sometimes I'll type the code in, and it will be correct, but I'll not understand why it worked. Should I just keep going and not worry about fully understanding it until I have more of a grip on the language? As Tenderfeet begin building their bridge across this canyon of cognizance, they're gaining consciousness of their own incompetence. They're learning to identify when and what they don't know. This Redditor recognizes that pieces of understanding are missing, but they can't yet identify what those pieces are. <laughs> so this halfway point between unconscious incompetence and conscious incompetence is where aha and duh moments start to happen. Um, Raven Covington told me about one of her first, where she said, I didn't realize how easily you could type something wrong and break your program. It seems very obvious to me now. She fixed her problem by asking for help, and apparently she was missing a comma or something. 
but she said she, it didn't occur to her at the time that the computer needed to know exactly what she wanted it to do. Zed Shaw talks about this repetition that Tenderfoot is having to go through in the intro of his series, Learn Code the Hard Way. He says, keep at it, force yourself. If you run into something you don't understand, skip it and come back to it later. Because with programming, there's this thing that happens where at first you will not understand anything, then one day, bang. Your brain will snap and you will suddenly get it. So some of this repetition can get a little lonely, but there are some things that Tenderfoot is just gonna have to figure out on her own. She's gonna have to have her own aha and her own duh moments. She's counting on that bang, now I get it, that Zed Shaw promises. With each of these aha and duh moments, she's inching her way across the canyon. She's learning what she has to learn. With her head down, focusing on all the bases she has to bar, she's steadily getting across the bridge. She has vocabulary, she has tools, she has the ability to ask better questions, she has resources on the other side of the canyon. She has all of these things in her knapsack. She has a uh, a view of the mountain. She knows what her goal is. So she'll have to continue barring the baths, but by the time she reaches the other edge of the canyon, she has more informed questions. What happens if I bar, if I baths the bar? How bad is a bazizzle? I know I needed a north, but what if I used a foo? She might not understand the answers, but that's for her next stage of learning, and that's what's gonna help propel her further up the mountain. So she's about to take her first step onto the safer, brighter side of the canyon. She'll have peers there, she'll have a community to learn with, she'll have a community to lean on. So at this point, I think she's gonna do pretty well. So everyone's very happy. <laughs> but, okay, if crossing the canyon of cognizance was a board game, we're about to quickly add the Pioneer Expansion Pack. This time, Tenderfoot has to accomplish the same things, but without any help from the other side of the canyon. This time, Tenderfoot is the first one to find her way out of the forest, hike her way up to the canyon, and figure out how to get across. She doesn't see anyone on the other side, no one she identifies as a friendly face, as someone who has made it already. She has no confidence that she can even get across. If no one else has, what makes her so special? What does this look like in the real world? Well, probably looks something like this. Um, this is the gender breakdown at some of the big companies we all know. I think there's some updated info that just came out this week and it's even worse. Um, this is racial breakdown at those same companies. So that looks pretty bad, but it can feel even worse. Um, especially if someone's in multiple groups here. If you, if you start toggling things on these interactive maps, you can get numbers as low as 0%, which is pretty low. Um, so if a tenderfoot in one of these multiple categories gets to the canyon and sees no one across, they're not going to even send a note to ask for help. Uh, Stephanie Herrera wrote about the importance of seeing someone early in the learning process in model view culture. She said, prospective and current students need to be able to see people like them in interview rooms and in classroom podiums at every level of these organizations from boardrooms to HR. And the value of this kind of presence is immeasurable. Knowing that that kind of presence is still all too rare, many established previous pioneers are working to improve this. The founder of Cody Wall Black, Dominic M. Liddell, said he started the group as an answer to say that there were no black workers in technology, because he's saying, we are here, and they want to be found. So after seeing no one on the other side of the canyon for far too long, imagine the joy and relief that Tenderfoot would feel if someone finally appeared, if that presence was finally visible. Ashley Nelson Hornstein wrote a blog post about when she found a new hero. Uh, her hero was Annie Jean Easley. Uh, Annie Jean Easley was an African-American computer programmer, a mathematician, aerospace engineer, who worked at what would become NASA from the 1950s through the 1980s. Um, Ashley found out about Annie Jean Easley on Twitter, 
And as soon as she did, she couldn't stop researching her and talking to her friends about her. Um, she wrote in the blog post, having visible examples of people that look like you in an aspirational professional field is powerful. By merely existing, these examples prove that there's an achievable pathway to that field. So Ashley talked with many of her friends about Easley's life and even got to meet Dr. Yvonne Cagle, a NASA astronaut. And when Ashley told Dr. Cagle about Annie Jean Easley and showed her a photo on Wikipedia, Ashley noticed that Dr. Cagle had a tangible emotional reaction. Annie Jean Easley, she was a pioneer. She had to find her own way across the canyon. But since Easley wasn't readily visible, Dr. Yvonne Cagle had to be a pioneer as well when she was building her own bridge across. So what can be done as a community to improve visibility, to aid the tenderfeet on the other side who might be pioneers? Whether you find yourself in an under or overrepresented group, how can we help the bridge building process? Groups and events like Rails Bridge, like the one held yesterday, uh, Coding While Black, Rails Girls, and their amazing Summer of Code pro program, AlterConf, TransHack, many, many more. These groups help these members of underrepresented groups uh, find a familiar face, and they can act as a beacon on the other side of the canyon so that there is something visible. And do these groups really work? I mean, y'all saw Anika's talk, right? Like, they work. So hopefully, more and more pioneering tenderfeet can send a paper airplane to someone they identify with. So let's ask ourselves, who are we lifting up as a global developer community in your own local developer community? What sort of events and groups are we promoting and funding? And are we, from our mountain of competence, sending the right messages to would-be members of our new community, uh, whether they're a pioneer or not? Because each message we craft, whether in person or online, should recognize the relative difficulty of the path that they've started. And which, with each well-crafted message and interaction, we're helping Tenderfeet bridge that treacherous canyon. We're helping them overcome the first major obstacle of many on their learning path. With each bridge built across the canyon, our mountain community grows. With each bridge built, we gain traveling companions with different experiences and different skill sets. The upcoming obstacles we'll face together might be completely new to, to me or to you, but might be something familiar to one of our new companions. So we can solve new and exciting things together. We just have to get them across first. So thank you. I just want to thank Tam, who drew all my tender feet and woodland creatures. And she's a, she's a pioneer herself. Stay in touch with me. OK, I ran out of time. <laughs>